This is Gerardo Del Real with my co-host, the world-famous Nick Hodge, and this is episode one of Bizarro World. What can you expect from Bizarro World? Expect lots of insights and smart talk from my co-host on junior resource stocks, the markets, hunting, and a lot more useful and wise chatter from Mr. Hodge. What should you expect from me? Expect a lot of ranting and raving on just about whatever comes to mind. Expect me to tell you things like why I would let Rihanna sing to me the ABCs and I would pay for an album of Rihanna singing the ABCs and a bunch of other useless facts and opinions. From time to time, we'll have guests on the show. We'll have some smart people. We'll have some people that think they're smart people. And we'll talk, of course, junior resource talks. We'll talk life. We'll probably offend some people. So if you are easily offended, you should probably get the fuck out now. I will wait a few seconds. Are they gone? I think so. All right. Uh, now that we've rid ourselves of the boring people, Nick, how are you doing, sir? I was just going to say I'm either going to leave or I'm one of those people who thinks they're smart. I don't know what to do. I, I, I need you, Nick, to, to provide the smart talk and a little reason. You, you, you will be the mature voice on this podcast. I promise you that. So please don't leave because if not, it's going to get ugly probably. I'll be here to chime in. How is life? Uh, we're doing good, you know. Uh, brand new start to the to the year, uh, 2019. Looking forward to it. Uh, expecting uh, a baby boy here in April. Uh, things are going good. Can't complain. I think we're in for a resource bull market, which we've been waiting for for a while. And I'm glad to be out of the mire that was 2018. That was just sort of a clusterfuck of a year all the way around. So. Um, good. I'm good. How about you? I think that's well said. I'm great. Uh, 2018 was absolutely a clusterfuck of a year. I'm glad that we're into 2019. You know, I, I, I think we have to look back a little bit before we look forward. And I'd like to start, if you don't mind, by giving out some awards. I think we should give out, you know, two or three awards in 2018 before we look forward. Does that does that work for you? I got a few. I got a few names down. Sure. I love it. I love it. Let's start with the most let's start with on a positive note let, let, let's start happy who was the best ir person for you in 2018 and when i say the best ir person i mean somebody that responds to emails when they put news out somebody that sends emails out contextualizing the news people that make themselves available people that are actually working at the shows and not just drinking their ass off who who, who checked those boxes for you even the good ones drink at the shows gerardo you know that <laughs> Guilty. I, I have Sean Thompson from Atlantic Gold. I think he mm. does a fantastic job. I, I think that's a tight run ship from top to bottom uh, as it is with the Moose River Consolidated Project in Nova Scotia. And in fact, it was you that introduced me to him a couple of years ago at this point. I think it's been at the New Orleans Investment Conference and I've been following the the story every, ever since. Uh, my readers have doubled their money, sold, bought back in and 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 now it looks like they're the project is is ramping up and, and there's some exploration upside as well. I know we're talking about the IR person and not the project, but Sean is um, doing those things that 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 you just said. He's emailing you when news come out. He's making sure you know what the guidance is. Um uh, and he's just gen generally keeping you informed. And, and from my seat as a newsletter writer, you know, he's he's showing up when I give talks at the at the various conferences and, and he's putting his face in the crowd and he's letting you know that he's there and that he's reading what you're writing and just generally trying trying to be involved. And, and that's his job. Right. I know it's his job, but he does a, He does a really good job of it. Uh, I have to agree. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Atlantic Gold has uh, performed the way it's performed and they've executed wonderfully here over the past 24 36 months getting that project up and going built finance i think the cost uh on on, on the per ounce cost are are top tier if i'm not mistaken is that right nick i think lowest cost of any junior producer in the world i mean uh, it's uh, it's like 560 dollars us or something something obscenely low so um yeah it's quite cheap Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, on my end, I'm going to have to go with a Brian Slusarchek from K92 Mining. He um he's now the the special capital markets advisor, some fucking title, but uh, the bottom line is he does IR for K92. This is someone that the minute there's news out, I get an email 5 minutes later with his take on it. Um, really, really does an amazing job of hammering home the main points. And I mean, he's active. The bottom line is whether I'm on LinkedIn, on Twitter, 
um, on the Resource Stock Digest website that you and I co-own. He is all over the place, and 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 like Sean, gets the job done. Um, so yeah, those would be my two. Is there anybody else that stands out to you? Well, I was just going to say, I think it's funny that both of our picks came from sort of lower mid-tier up and coming producers. It seems like they have a bit mm-hmm. higher level of, of maturity, I guess it is when it comes to, to telling their story and being in the market. Cause, and this is just my gut take. There's actually some accountability there, right? When it comes to guidance and cost and, and numbers, as opposed to a junior where it's a lot more uh, telling of the story and not as much accountability. And I just think that accountability translates given that both of our top picks were actually producing gold. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Anyone else that, uh, that deserve, deserves an honorable mention on your part? Yeah. Yeah, sure. If we're doing honorable mentions, I think Liz Monger from, from Midas Gold is ah, great. You beat uh, me to that one, Damn you, <laughs> Nick. <laughs> and, 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 and and I think, um, although he wears multiple hats uh, with multiple companies and sends a lot of emails, I think Sean Perger is pretty good. He's always in there elbowing for his companies, uh, trying to get them coverage, and again, is at all the shows and is, is is showing support to the to the newsletter writers and the people that that show support to his companies. So I, I think he's pretty good. Absolutely, absolutely. Can we uh, nominate Amir Adnani? Oh no, he's not an IR person. He just wears all the hats, right? <laughs> You and I think exactly the same. He was going to be my pick as well. That's funny. Uh, I just spoke with Amir yesterday. Uh, it was a great conversation, but man, that guy can talk and he's factual and knows his stuff. So he, he definitely uh, goes to bat for his companies, all jokes aside. It can't, it can't be I all mean, positive, Nick. Let, let, let's talk some negative. If you had something to say, go ahead. No, I was going to say the exact same thought I had him on my list as IR person as well. That's funny. He does a great <laughs> job. He's always going to bat for his companies, be it uranium or gold. So, I mean, you can't you can't knock anybody for that. You can't. Shareholders should be happy with, uh, with the performance they get out of Amir. Like I was saying, it can't be all positive. Um, what was the biggest disappointment for you company-wise in 2018? What was the biggest disappointment? I have four names written down. Oh, um, and man, for me, you're rough, Nick. I ah, thought God. I was what, the one that was going to piss people off on this podcast. <laughs> it was a rough year, man. We started out by saying that it was a pretty bad 2018. And so I looked at personal holdings. You know, there was a lot of disappointments out there, but I looked at things that disappointed me and my wallet personally. And one of the biggest disappointments for me was hand and metals. I really thought they were going to, going to, um, find some mineralization in Ireland. You you took the trip there. I mean, I I invested in multiple private placements, personal, personal funds. And I just thought that Kilbricken and, and the way Mike Hudson was talking and I don't know, it just seemed really good to me. And when that, when those drill results came back, sort of, eh, it was like, that was, that was, that was sort of disappointing. My heart sunk a bit on that one because I really thought they had a shot. Agreed. I still have my uh, stock certificates on my desk, as I tell you all the time. Uh, in fairness to, to Mr. Hudson and Hannon, um, I, I did visit the property. I met with the technical team. You know, they're 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 employing some some top notch uh, technology out there. And in fairness to them, they're not done drilling. They'll likely have to raise money here soon. But there may still be a discovery to be had. In Ireland, uh, the second part that I'll say is I know that they've recently staked a project, a copper project in Peru. And and the other thing they've done well is they've kept their share structure reasonable to where it allows for a miss, frankly. If they do miss on this next target and they have to pivot away from Ireland and they don't reach that target of 10 million tons of, of you know, 10%, the 10 and 10 rule in Ireland, right? Then that they have the flexibility to pivot, and I think it's important for for companies and for people listening that speculate in this space to understand that the norm in this industry is exploration companies are gonna miss, but a share structure that's reasonably tight um, allows you the flexibility to pivot to new projects, and so can't overstress how important share structure is. Um, so we'll leave it there. But yeah, disappointment, absolutely. Who do you got, number two? Allegiant Gold was really disappointing. They had multiple targets identified, multiple projects they were drilling for gold with uh, one of the best geologists in the world who's found uh, multiple projects. And it just, they came up empty as well. Um, that's the that's the spin out from uh, Columbus Gold, if anybody is familiar. And um, Nevada properties, know, right? That All Nevada properties, right. Um, and 
look, I mean, these were these were properties where we thought we were going to make a discovery and it's just been nothing yet. And multiple properties have been drilled and it's always, well, now we're excited about this property. Well, now we're excited about this property. And I know that's how exploration goes, like you just said. I mean, only one in 1,000 targets if that becomes a mine. And so there's a lot more failure than success. But nonetheless, it's disappointing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Number three. Shall I keep going? American Pacific was really disappointing. Yeah, that was tough. Uh, uh, they were talking about visible gold when when we raised their money. There's been no visible gold at Tuscarora since. Um, you think it's I Nevada? Mean, they, you they... think there's any gold left in Nevada? <laughs> <laughs> we'll Fucking Nevada. Can, we'll see if Dennis Higgs can find it in the groundwater. Who knows? All right. We'll see. I don't know, man. Nevada. <laughs> tough. Okay. Yeah. And the same thing with American Pacific. Now they're looking to pick up other projects. Sort of the same with Hannon. You can sort of read the tea leaves, right? If, if they were if they were really, really happy with the project they had and were drilling, they wouldn't be out there securing additional properties. Um and then the last one was Milrock. I thought they, I thought we had mineralization. I thought we had a discovery at La Navidad late in 2017, early 2018. Have raised them money a couple of times now, and and you know, obviously Greg Beisher works his ass off, and um, and has some great properties. We just haven't, we just haven't seen the discovery yet. And so those would be my four disappointments. But but like you, I still hold shares. That's our problem, right? We're we're holders and not sellers. You're fucking eternal optimist, us. <laughs> I'm sitting here with a stack of certificates. I will take a picture and uh, I'll post it one day. Just stacks and stacks of certificates. Anyway. Yeah. All right, so those are the four. I got to agree with you on Millrock. I, I I wasn't fond of the twenty five cent placement at the time. I thought it was the bottom. It turns out Greg was smart when he raised money at twenty five cents because the next one was done at ten cents. So let's see if two thousand nineteen brings us some good luck uh, on the Millrock side. I know they're 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 edging up to a discovery up in Alaska and they got a lot of land. They got a huge database that I think is valuable. And uh, hopefully we get some news out of that here in the next couple of months. It'll be interesting to see what the strategy will be from Mill Rock. So we'll see. I'm holding. All right. I like it. Uh, on my end, I got to say leading edge materials. Um, you know, this is a company that has a fully constructed, fully permitted uh, graphite project in Sweden. Um, Europe is is ramping up its search for to establish a critical metal supply chain. And obviously you're going to need the graphite, cobalt, lithium, all these things, right? Everything that goes into the electrification of everything. Electric vehicles are very real. These are sustainable trends. I thought they were so well positioned and ahead of a mega trend, frankly. They're the only project in that region that's at that advanced stage. Um, they're part of the North Volt coalition that that was raising billions of dollars to to secure these minerals and these properties. And, you know, the bottom line is they weren't able to secure the contracts that they needed last year to get the company in front of the market and have the market recognize the value there. I still think there is a lot of value there. I think they'll also have a good 2019. But, yeah, 2018 was absolutely disappointing. They have two rare earth assets that are very valuable in themselves. And, um, you know, they just picked up a property in Romania that looks exciting. But, you know, anytime you hear news that the company is looking at a strategic review, then I, I, I think you mentioned the tea leaves. I think it's in the cards that we're going to get some uh, some reshuffling there of, uh, of, of priority. So I'm curious to see what comes out of that. So leading edge materials would be the one. And uh, you had four, so I'm, I'm going to cap it there. Go ahead, Nick. I was going to say they were separate before they were they were different companies before you know much more of the history but it might be worth just explaining they were separate entities before they were leading edge materials. Yeah, I, I still have my original Flinders warrant certificates. It's funny that you mentioned that. So, you know, at one point these are companies that there were two companies it was Flinders and it was Tasman Metals. Yeah, Ta yeah yep. Tasman had the rare earth assets and you know, these are companies in 2010 that, that I did well with. I, I, I made good money with them. It was the same group of people. The assets were receiving a lot of attention, mostly because of the rare earth assets on the Tasman side. And people people realized that this electrification of everything trend was real. But these are companies that traded you know, at $3 a share. Um, Tasman at one point, I think, was up to $4 a share. And you know they merged the companies. They, they The thought was you make one super critical metals company that has everything again from lithium to cobalt to uh, rare earths to graphite and you know right now they sit there with a, a market cap i think of approximately 15 million 20 million dollars they're trading for 21 cents canadian so uh different times but let's see hopefully it's a round trip ticket right 
Everyone's waiting for that bull market. I like it. I like it. Uh, I want to talk bull market. I want to talk gold in a little bit, but let's uh, let's finish out the awards. The top three buyout candidates. I have two. Who do you got? I, I, I know one of yours, so I'm not going to steal it. I'm pretty sure I do anyway. I think uh, I'm going to go back to Atlantic Gold. I think yeah. those guys get taken out. Um, there's been a return to sort of merger and acquisition activity where we see that high quality projects need to be taken out. And, and we know that the the recently completed merger between Barrick and Rango Gold, they're looking for projects. There was rumors swirling this week that they could be interested in, in buying Predium, but but Predium has some some great issues and some they have some insider selling some, issues. Too. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, fuckers. You said it, um, right? And so if you look at quality producing projects in, in Canada, Atlantic clearly rises to the top of the list. We mentioned the low cost. Um, you know, Stephen Dean comes from a, a major background. He's very good at, at, at grade control. He's kept the project on budget. You've said those things already. Um, I think Atlantic is one that has to get taken out. And then one company that nobody talks about, and really I don't talk about it a lot either, is a company called uh, Taranga Gold. They have some um, a producing mine in Africa. They're building another mine, and they've got a, a pretty high-quality uh, exploration asset as well. They exceeded their production guidance in, in 2018. They're producing over uh, 100,000 ounces of gold, I, I believe it is, and, and the stock has performed quite well. And so just a company called Taranga, T-E-R-A-N-G-A, is, is one you might want to want to take a look at. You want to go ahead and talk about Amadin, Gerardo? You, you, you know I do. You know, <laughs> we speculate in the resource space for one reason and one reason only, right? Because we want to make money. Uh, we know it's volatile. We know what to look for. You look for share structure. You look for great management. You look for people that have had success in the past doing what they're now looking to duplicate. And I think Almaden is a perfect example of a great asset with great management, great exploration potential. And the market, frankly, just didn't give a shit for most of 2018. Um, they hit a 52-week low on November the 14th of 48 cents. This is on the U.S. side. Um, Are they back to a 52-week high yet? They're they're close. They're at 82 cents. <laughs> they're at 82 cents. They've they've nearly doubled. And the 52-week high is um, it's a dollar and two cents. So they're 20 cents away. So you know that's why we do what we do in this market. I've been buying on the way down. I've been urging uh, subscribers. For those that don't know, Nick Hodge writes three premium subscription-based newsletters. I write two. We're not here to plug those. It's cheesy, but just giving you some context. Um. You know, I've been urging subscribers to to double down and to buy on the way down. And so that's that's paid off. You know, the stock went from 50 cents on the U.S. side to just shy of 90 cents in the course of a week and a half. So Almaden Minerals, I think they just had a feasibility study that was absolutely fantastic. The IRR was great. The net present value is three to four times of the current, uh, the, the, the current market cap. There's a ton of exploration potential. I've been to the project. The community is really behind it. Um, you have your the typical, mill. The yeah. mill. what's that? The, the mill, the mill. Oh, everybody forgets the mill. And what do I do? I forget the mill. So they have a mint condition mill that is being shipped to Mexico and a little history on this mill. It was up and running for two months. The crisis hit back in the days and uh, it's a $70 million mill brand new. It operated for two months. They shut it down. They were able to come in and use the bear market and scoop this thing up for something like six, $7 million um, in total consideration. So that's how you use a bear market to your advantage. Um, that mill alone is worth almost the entire market cap um, of Almaden. It's got a market cap right now, even after this recent run up of 88 million US. And that mill, the mint condition mill, shaved something like $70 million from the capex. So, you know, you get four and a half million gold equivalent ounces. It's a polymetallic deposit, equal parts gold and silver, tons of exploration upside. 93% of the property is untouched. Um, you know, they own their own drills. They're going to be drilling again soon. And you have a market cap of $88 million, So what are you going to do, right? Tough market. Uh, a, buying $4.5 million gold equivalent ounces for free is, is good work in my book if you can get it. It's good work if you can get it. Absolutely. And, and the other one that I got, I know that you had a couple and I had one and that makes three. But let's, uh, let, let's add one more in there. You got to talk about Midas Gold. And I'll let you talk a bit about Midas. We're both familiar with both shareholders, I believe. 
Um, huge fan of Stephen Quinn and that team. We mentioned Liz earlier on the IR side. Why should we like Midas Gold, Nick? Uh, you should like Midas Gold because it's in Idaho, so it's in the U.S., uh, a friendly uh, mining jurisdiction. It's uh, got six pr- six million proven ounces uh, of gold there, and there's likely two and a half to three, maybe more times that amount there. Uh, they're already going through permitting, um, albeit it's been delayed a bit, but nothing with the government is is ever on time. And so they're working through the permitting now. Um Geez, there's so many superlatives. <laughs> it would be like the third or fourth largest, highest grade open pit mine in the country once it's built. Um, it's got a lot of antimony there, which is a critical element that uh, America currently produces none of. That's a critical flame retardant for uh, military uh, applications and, and, and other applications. Um, and I, I, I think the reason you're mentioning it as a, as a buyout candidate is the sulfur thing that, that, that yes. the market is starting to be aware of now with, with Barrick Gold. And we've already said that that Barrick Rand Gold wants to make acquisitions of top tier projects. Well, it doesn't get much more top tier than uh, the Stibnite project that Midas Gold has. And so there's this whole technical thing, and I'm not a technical guy, but apparently um, Barrick's Gold Strike Mine in Nevada needs higher sulfur content ore to help make their operations go smoothly. That's my technical word, make it go better. (laughs) And... um, (laughs) <laughs> and if you draw a 500 mile circle around gold strike one of the best projects in that circle is, is midas gold that's that meets barracks criteria and guess what oh it also has the right amount of sulfur content in its ore so you know for all those reasons plus more i think that that midas gold gets taken out i hope it's at, at much higher prices than we currently sit at but it's one of the highest quality undeveloped gold projects not just in the country but the world and, and great people behind it as well and yes i'm a shareholder I absolutely agree. Um, I'll throw in upper quartile as far as grades go. We know they have at least 6.6 million ounces. You and I were at the project, I believe, last year. We looked at the mountain that hosts the other 14 million ounces. We've speculated uh, there's 20 million there. I know Steven yeah. hates when he does that. When we do that, <laughs> he hates when we say there's 20 million ounces there. But look, the bottom line, all jokes aside, is that there's tons of exploration potential, and you have a 6.6 million ounce head start. Um, upper quartile and again a project that's actually going to do a lot of good in 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 regards to reclamation and cleaning up the mess that previous miners back during the war days um, left so a lot to like there a project the salmon would probably vote yes on agreed no doubt and the communities as well so Midas has done a great job of putting together community coalitions I believe they just had a meeting this week um, to get the the town of McCall I believe it was to, to join that coalition but other city councils have already voted in favor I forgot to mention the salmon but yeah this has already been a mine back in the in the world war days that it provided that critical antimony that I was talking about and back then there was no um, environmental regulations right so they just did whatever they had to do to get the minerals out of the ground and left the site like it was so the min the the river has 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 been shut down since uh i think the 1920s or something like that or the 1930s and no salmon have been able to to migrate and so yeah the the salmon would definitely vote in favor of this project and just to explain quickly why 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 stephen quinn hates when when we say there's 15 or 20 million ounces there it's a strategic thing right um you know, we don't just say that for laughs and we don't just say that to say there's 20 million ounces there, but it's harder to get a giant project permitted. Just ask Northern Dynasty. It's much harder to get a big project permitted. Um, so it, it, it's easier for them to permit five or six million ounces. And then after they get the permit, say, oh, by the way, there's 10 or 15 million more ounces here than it is to say, hey, we've got 15 or 20 million ounces of gold and we want to permit this giant gold project right now. It's easier to get a smaller project permitted. And that's why that's why the company likes to be tight-lipped about how much gold is really there because they want the the regulatory bodies to think they're just permitting a small project when in fact i think it's going to be much bigger down the road liz, and that's it on liz, my, Steven, and that's if it you're on listening stop, stop listening if you're listening steve <laughs> don't listen anymore steven we're not going to tell anybody about the other 14 million ounces sorry guys <laughs> All right. What else do we got? You, you know, let me ask you a question real quick. And this just came up in my brain. Is Idaho the new Nevada? You know, you have companies like Revival Gold that's having a lot of success bringing back, 
you know, the past producing bear track project, you have Midas gold, you know, you have other companies in the state that are exploring and, and frankly, putting out Integra put out some amazing results. I think it was like a 400 meter step out um, of, of the known resource. And, and, you know, we talked about the failure of some of the exploration companies recently in Nevada. And, and don't get me wrong. There's been success, obviously in Nevada is, 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 has been the kingmaker of companies for a long time, but is, is, is Idaho the new Nevada? Yeah, I was going to mention Integra as well. That was over a hundred meter hit they had of two and a half uh, gram equivalent gold. So that's quite the hole. And that was from a company that was um, relatively silent over the past four to six months. They really haven't put out much news. And look, they put out one hole and the, the stock has gone from below 65 cents to to 90 cents in, in less than a month. And so, yeah, it speaks to, to how fast quality junior mining companies can move. But to your Idaho point, um, yeah, uh, look, Revival Gold has, I think, averaged over uh, a, a gram a ton across all the holes that they've drilled. Um, obviously, Midas is there. Otis is there. Integra is there. There's some growing cobalt exploration. Mm. Um, and we know that it has a really mining-friendly governor um, it, 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 in Butch Otter, although he's now coming to the end of his reign there. It's not too often that you get the governor of the state you're operating in to go on a, a roadshow with you to help you raise money and, and tell the bankers how friendly the state is. Um, regulatory wise and politically wise to to mining, and that's exactly what the governor did last year with uh, um, that that I think they call it Idaho Mining Days or something like that. And it gets back to Liz Monger who helped put that together. Uh, Midas is IR person, uh, credit to her. But when you have the governor going out on, on roadshows with you, it, it it sort of says, "Hey, my state's open for mining business, and the and the resources that are being found there speak for themselves." Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Um... It wouldn't be a maiden podcast, Nick, if we didn't talk Trump. It makes for an awesome hashtag. It pisses people off. It makes people happy. I don't know. People, Trump is like Tesla, right? I, I get on Twitter yeah. sometimes, and man, some of the so called smartest people either just like fan crush Tesla or like completely hate Tesla. It's, it's like there's no in between. Trump is kind of like the same thing. So, should we talk Trump? I mean, I'll talk Trump if you want. Uh, I'm not a big Trump talker, but you know, I, I certainly won't won't shy away from it. it, it do it for the I, hashtag, I it. Nick. Do it for the hashtag. Yeah, <laughs> do it for the hashtag. Um, yeah, look, I mean, the same people. He, he people that were you know fanboys. You say fanboys. People that were fanboys of Obama are you know vitriolic against Trump, right? And they yep. hate him. Uh, but they hate him for some of the same things that 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 o that Obama has done. And, and I'm sort of an apolitical um, agnostic person. I'm, I'm a libertarian. I, I don't try to mess with either of the parties. But just take the shutdown, for instance. You know, everybody's railing against Trump for shutting down the government and just separate the wall out for a second. Um, these TSA agents aren't getting their paychecks. Uh, the, the national parks are closed. This and that. He's the worst person ever. But everybody forgets that in 2013, Obama shut down the government uh, to force policy down our throats as well. It, it, it's just a presidential tactic. But but I, I I don't recall the people who were who are currently um, so angry at Trump being angry at Obama when he shut down the government. And that just speaks to partisanship, right? I mean, it's like it, you're just mad because he's a Republican or you're just mad because he's a Democrat. It's it, it, You're not mad because of the the shutdown. You're mad because of, of, of who is behind the, the shutdown. And to me, that's just hollow. I, I'd call it fake outrage. It's like it's just you're just upset to be upset, right? I mean, right. that's that's my take anyway. <laughs> I, I agree. I think um, I, I share similar sentiments when it comes to politics. There's issues that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more I'm more I lean more left and there's issues that I lean more right on. You know, Chris Rock's got that famous joke that, you know, when it comes to guns and the Second Amendment, um, I, I, I tend to be more of a libertarian and a Republican in the sense that I, I, I value the Second Amendment. I think it's important. I think there's a, a smart way to, to honor that. And that's a whole different discussion for another day. But, you know, when it comes to my niece and my sister and my mom, I'm, I'm more conservative, right? Like sure. that was the great Chris Rock line. So I, I, I think that partisanship in this country and, and globally, frankly, but let's keep it to the U.S. for now, is the cancer that is preventing actual governing from happening. I think that, you know, this antiquated system of voting for people um, 
of voting for the favorite Kardashian, right? Is 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 really hollowing out the best parts of this country, whether you're for Trump or against Trump. Uh, you know, I, I look forward to a days where we could vote on ideas. Uh, I, I look forward to a day where, you know, a group of elected representatives present ideas and you vote on that, not on people. You know, um, I see the young lady from New York and, you know, they, they, they found a video from high school or college or whatever it was. And, oh, my God, she was dancing and having fun. You're mad about a girl in college that was dancing and having fun? Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? It's weird. It's weird. It's odd. But, um, yeah, I, I share similar sentiments. I will say this. Do you think Trump gets a, a, a bad rap from the media? I, I, I notice sometimes that, you know, he's done some good things. There's a lot I disagree with. I, I, I think he's a bonehead on a lot of fronts um, and, and, and a child in some senses. Um, but he's done some good things. He's got some hostages freed. He's brought China back to the table on, on you know, IP theft, very real and consequential intellectual property theft right these are good things There's, do you think he gets the credit that he deserves for the good stuff that he's done we all know he gets bashed for the bad stuff and rightfully so a lot of times but he's done some good things there's been some criminal justice reform uh as, as well and so no look he doesn't get any and 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 i'm not a trump supporter and i hate that i have to say that whenever i, I defend trump or, or bash the media but it just that's just where we are. Um, I'm no, Mexican. He doesn't get any credit. <laughs> uh, yeah, <no>. Mexican American. <laughs> I got to preface everything with, hey, hey, I'm not a Trump supporter. We can get around the wall. I joked in the newsletter this last month that, you know, I talked to all 129 million Mexicans and nobody gives a shit about the wall. Like the only people that care about the wall, are the Republicans and the Democrats. Nobody really cares about the wall. The wall's not going to do anything. You could waste the taxpayer money. It's not going to make a bit of difference. Most of right. the illegal people and the illegal drugs and everything, it goes through because of corrupt border patrol agents and tunnels and everything almost but an entry point. So, yeah, you know, that's a whole other discussion. I, but back to your point. I, I no, I, I was reading the testimony from the um, El Chapo case this week. I was reading some of the testimony, and, and that was crazy, Gerardo. You probably know more about it than I do, being Mexican American. But he was talking about this is um, it was like Guzman's right hand man's son who was testifying, and this was the yes. guy that's supposed to take over the Sinaloa cartel. His dad. Um, Shout out to Vice. Heard. Vice has been doing a great job reporting <laughs> on that. Yeah, I guess his dad has been running the Sinaloa cartel, and he sort of laid it all out, like um, who was getting bribed, military officials who were getting like 50, 60 grand a month, how his dad had a million dollar a month bribe budget. But the thing that was really struck me was he was talking about a meeting they had with uh, Pemex officials. This is like yes. the National Oil Corporation, right? Yes. And he was talking about shipping kilos of cocaine on the oil tankers, man. And yes. I was like, holy shit, that runs deep. Yes. Yes. And, and it, you know, without getting too much into it, um, yes, it runs deep. I'll, I'll leave it there because that's a discussion that we should probably save for another day and get a little bit more in depth about. But, it, you know, it, it doesn't just speak to the corruption on the Mexican side. It also speaks to the corruption on the U.S. side. It was interesting to me that during the testimony, the prosecutor refused to and the judge refused to allow Mr. Guzman's lawyer to talk about the Fast and Furious operation, right? Which anybody in Mexico can tell you is where all the guns are coming from. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it is what it is. We're talking hundreds of thousands of guns, and they refused to allow that testimony because they said it would compromise active operations, which, of course, means that they're still sending guns that way. So it cuts sure. both ways. It's a deeper conversation. Hundreds of thousands of people have died, have been raped, have been you know extorted, have been kidnapped. Um, I, I'll share a funny, not funny story with you. I have a cousin who was accidentally kidnapped during his midterm in college. He, uh, this is in Zacatecas, Mexico, where my family is from. He was taking his midterm, and the, the, the teacher said that he was wanted at the office. So he went to the office, and uh, there were these guys sitting there with you know semi-automatic rifles, and they put a hood on him, and they took him. And... <laughs> As they're driving around with my cousin, my cousin goes, what are you guys doing? And he goes, is this your name? And he goes, yeah. And they start telling him, well, you're doing this and you're doing that. And he goes, no, I'm not that guy. So to make a long story short, they thought he was someone else. And unfortunately for my cousin, he shared the same name as this guy. And what's funny, not funny is the kidnappers already had him. 
So they were like, fuck it. Let's get some money out of this kid. We're not going to get what we thought we were going to get, but let's call the family up. And it, you know, it took about a week and a half and, and people pitching in um, to get them back. Jesus. That's one story, right? And again, this is a kid who is doing nothing. This is a good kid in college, studying to be an attorney, taking midterms, minding his business, the most square cousin I have probably. And he's the one that ends up getting kidnapped, man, accidentally. Mm. So yeah, yeah. Deeper discussion, deeper dive. We'll do that one one day. And affects people that obviously have nothing to do with it. So yeah, terrible. Um, and I still remember what your question was. It was about Trump. So we can get back to that. Yep. Yeah, look, an example I saw this week was about how um, the IRS was still going to issue uh, refunds while the government was shut down. And uh, I saw somebody post the headlines from various news outlets that were covering that particular story. And the the one that was sort of in the middle was, I think it was Fortune or Forbes, said something like, IRS working to make sure you get refunds while government is shut down, which yeah. is cut and dried. That's what the story is. But then you had like CNBC say, no way Trump is going to be able to give you your refund during his shutdown. And Vox is saying something like experts don't think Trump is going to be able to pay your refund. So it's clear that there's like, I mean, you know, it's just media bias. This is, it's been around for, for decades, if not longer. And so it's just part, it's just part of the game, right? You got to be able to see through it. And the problem is that uh, a lot of people don't or don't want to. You and I have talked about uh, the fourth turning in the past. We've had private conversations and a phenomenal book for those of you that have not read it. Um, do you have faith that the, the, the youth, I know s historically, cyclically, it's how it happens, right? But do you have faith that the youth of today will see past the bullshit on both sides and, and actually pull, you know, government's heads out of their collective ass? Yeah, I do. I think it's going to take a bit of time. Um, uh, I'll, I'll wax a bit philosophical for you. I, I think that these I told you guys he was smart. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that these millennials um, are just now coming of age, and I, I, I count my among uh, I count myself among sort of the oldest millennials. We were born in like 1982, 83, 84, uh, and I'm 35 years old. I'm just now having kids, putting down roots. And the majority of the millennials, uh, which we know there are tens of millions, it's quite a large um, cohort of, of people. They were born all the way until the year uh, 2000, 2001, 2002. So some of those millennials aren't even 18 yet. And um, as we've seen over the last half century, it takes longer for Americans to come of age, uh, to mature not physically I'm talking about, I'm talking about mentally because we're delayed a bit now. We either live with our parents longer or um, you know, we get degrees and then we don't start our career until we're 25 or 26. And so we really don't get that uh, political uh, uh, intelligence and, and development and that uh, emotional control until much later in life. And I think that until the, the majority of the millennials get that, it's hard for them to to inflect change and, and run for office and, and and be taken as serious politicians. But I think it's coming. You mentioned AOC from from New York. She's gaining some traction. Look at the kids um, from the, the, the school shooting. Uh, uh, Hogg is his last name. The young kid has, is, is getting a voice. And so I think it's going to happen. I think we're, we're smack dab in the middle of this fourth turning. I think it, it still has a, a long way to turn. But I think you're seeing good things come about. We're seeing... Um, legalization of marijuana. We're seeing the eradication of, of, of marijuana uh, related offenses on, on criminal on the criminal side. We're seeing um, uh, police being held accountable. We're seeing finally <clears throat> priests being held accountable. And these are this is these are much bigger things that have to do with the, the fourth turning. The fourth turning is about um, realigning our priorities um, as a society, and then in, in turn those 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 priorities being reflected in our institutions. And I think we're a long, long way from, from getting on the, on the, on the path that we need to be on. I think the, the 2020 presidential election will be very interesting in that respect. And we're also seeing finally people, corporations, not governments yet, but you know, I, I, I think overall we're seeing people taking a step towards really appreciating and valuing women. Right. And, and not saying they're better or they're worse, but, you do a job, you deserve the same pay that a man would get. It should be based on skill set. And it's 
it's amazing to me that it's 2019 and we're just starting to have this conversation, right? It's crazy to me. It's it's taken a long time and 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 it's some some of the studies I've seen are you know, I don't know, necessarily know how they sit with me because I'm obviously all for equality, but I'm for merit-based equality. And so Absolutely. some of the things I some of the things I see where where we're just counting up um, and I'll give you one example just because I saw it this week. It was like three PhDs. And so this is like PhD level research now, right? right? They basically they basically just counted up the number of films that were directed by women in the past. I think it was like 10 or 15 years uh, versus men and, and, and said, well, I think only 3% of the films were directed by women. And, and, and obviously their takeaway is, well, women are underrepresented as directors in Hollywood. And that may be the case, but for me, things are merit-based and I'm also big on the market. And so I might sound a little bit sexist here, but, um, what's the reason that there, that there aren't more female directors? Um, is it merit-based? Is it, um, are they being ostracized by the men? Um, and, and taking it back further, this is a discussion I'd love to have. How did the men get in a, a in a position where they were in control anyway? I mean, what oh, is the, yeah. yeah. I mean, why weren't the women in control to begin with? I mean, like what? you said, check yourself, check yourself at the door for this podcast. If the women were truly equal, like why aren't they just truly equal from the, from the beginning? Why, why on their own merits and their own tenacity and their own d- directorship prowess, aren't they directing more films? And, and I don't know if that's right or wrong. That's just how my, that's just my gut take when I see studies like that. And furthermore, why the fuck did you spend $150,000 to get your PhD to count up female directors? Right, right. Yeah. And I think that's, probably, that, that, that's the funniest part of your statement, but probably the least important. Let's talk about, I'll bite, I'll bite on this discussion. Cause I think it's important. Um, I, I would answer your question by saying, and let's just talk the U S again, the institutions in place in this country, when the country was founded, air quotes, <laughs> um, was set up by white men. That's just a fact, right? A consequence of that was a constitution that, again, favored white men. Um, that's, can we agree on that? Oh, yeah. Okay, perfect. So I, I, I think if we want to take it all the way back, I think the founding fathers, um, frankly, set up a system that would ensure that they could maintain and sustain power for multiple, multiple generations. I don't believe minorities or women were looked at as equal partners, even privately a lot of times, right? Definitely not publicly. So if you and I set up a community and we set up, in effect, our own homeowners association with our own rules, we get to call the shots on how that happens, right? So if, if, you know, a, a, a young Mexican kid or a young black kid or a, or a low income white kid can't go to the right universities and meet the right people. They're never going to learn how to become a city council person or a governor or shit, God forbid, a president one day. Right. It's just mm-hmm. not going to happen because a large part of the way success in America happens is that network of people that you're able to access. I think women for hundreds of years have been not allowed in to those positions of power. I think it's turning. I think we're starting to see it. But again, when we talk about should it be merit-based, everything should be merit-based, right? I don't I don't think that, you know, me being a, a Mexican-American kid, right? Both my parents from Mexico. I, I, I joke that I was made in Mexico but born in the U.S., and that's true. Mm. My mother came to this country when she was five months pregnant. They came. They wanted a better life. They worked for 30 years. Then they moved back to Mexico. I was lucky enough to be born in Los Angeles and, and have dual citizenship. But should I be allowed entry into a university just because – I'm of Mexican descent. Absolutely fucking not. Right. It should be merit based. Um, should I get the nod to direct a movie just because I can fill the quota? You know, I joke all the time because frankly, y- you know, we're, we're in an industry that, that doesn't see a lot of uh, minority people participating. Um, and I joke that I'm, I'm like the token Mexican that fills up the quota for everybody and makes everybody feel good. But, you know, I think there's really a system set up from the get that, 
made it very, very difficult for women to vote, for women to participate, for women to get equal pay once they made it through the door. And I think I think we're still there to a large extent. Um, that's that's my quick take on that. You should meet my one black friend. <laughs> No, I'm joking. Um, This is what I... (laughs) Shout out to Nick's one black friend. We got to hashtag that one. My one black friend. This is what I would say. uh, And then we could get off the heavy topics. Um, The founding fathers were clearly flawed. If everyone is created equal, but slavery is equal. That's sort of a non-starter. And two is... um, if we take it all the way back before the founding fathers, I mean, what were they probably thinking, right? We, we won this hard out. Like we are the white men that won. Um, you know, the native Americans didn't win. The French didn't win. The English didn't win. The Mexicans didn't win the, the yep. white men. I mean, they, they won the right. And if you're yep. talking about merit based in 1776, I mean, t- there's no more merit based than, than, than beating the British army. I mean, that's what yep. it was. You know what I mean? So that's, I mean, that's all I got. That brings up another interesting question. <laughs> I told you'd be ranting and raving, whatever came to mind, right? Um, so, so if that, if that earned the founding fathers, and I agree with you, by the way, the right, right, the, to the winner goes the spoils. Is that the right way to 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 take it back? Well, that's sort of what I was thinking about while you were talking, and and I don't know the answer. It's not 1776 anymore. <laughs> um, I, I don't know that you could, given the the level of government intrusion and spying. I'm not sure you could form a coalition to take on the government these days. Um, but but I think some of that sentiment is still running through us. I live in eastern Washington, man. We still have militias and stuff. I mean, just last year we had Oregon farmers facing off the gover- facing off against the government, and in fact won. And so those currents um, are still alive and well. I was there recently. And, you were my white privileged friend. I made sure I went everywhere with you, Nick. <laughs> Catching me outside by myself. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, we'll get back to that. I, I we're gonna talk about that another day, another time. Um, that's interesting. That was that, that was interesting. I, it's a good conversation. All right, Nick. What else you got? We've been rambling for forty five minutes. Should we let him off the hook, or should we keep going? Yeah, I just want to talk about a couple positive things. All I'm right. We talked slavery. We talked racism. We talked sexism. Let's <laughs> talk about a lot of positive stuff. So I didn't know until recently, um, in fact, my mother-in-law told me when she was here visiting for uh, Christmas because she's an animal person, but I didn't know how many male chicks were killed annually. I guess um, in industrial farming, the males obviously don't lay eggs, so they're not profitable in that respect. Uh, And because they're males, they take too much input requirements. Um, It's too expensive to feed them, to turn them into meat birds. So what happens is after they're born, like billions, billions with a B of male chicks just get like industrially slaughtered like two days after they're hatched, which I didn't even know was a thing. Well, just late, and you didn't either, it sounds like. No, it sounds Um, like a merit-based system. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and so this German company has now found a way to identify the sex of the chicken in the egg so that the companies, chicken companies don't have to hatch the ones that are going to be male. And so they don't have to kill the male chicks. They can only let the eggs that are going to be hens um, actually hatch. And it only adds like a penny or two uh, per dozen of eggs. And that's just a development in the past three weeks. So I thought that was quite, quite interesting and positive. And we'll put links up to some of the things we talked about um, below the podcast. And then just one more interesting thing uh, I thought I'd share this week because I'm into sort of animals in the outdoors is scientists have discovered that whales sing. And some whales, they start a song when they're young and they'll develop a song until it gets to a certain complexity, sometimes for 12 or 15 or 20 years. And then once it reaches a certain complexity, they stop singing the song and start over on a new one. And I just thought that was too fascinating not to share. So we'll put a a link up to that as well. And last thing for me, and then I'll shut up is um, Ray Dalio penned a a pretty long piece. I think it was uh, last week or or early this week, um, sort of framing what he sees going on um, in the economy, given that the fed is still raising, but we have some mixed economic signals, um, you know, uh, housing is soft in some places, but uh, employment is um, 
it, it is still very strong. Um, Apple cut earnings, but there's some other positive lights. And so I just thought that the piece that he wrote about the long term and the short term debt cycle and um, how the Fed is involved in that and how it creates wealth disparity and translates into things you're seeing in the stock market and economy was very smart. So we'll put the link up to that. And that's it. I'm done. I encourage everybody, everybody to read Mr. Dalio's latest book and I'll, I'll, we'll find the name for it and, and put the link up, but it's, it's, it's well-written. It's a great story. Um, you know, this is a guy, I'll, I'll share one funny story from the book who's always been an outsider, right? Um, he started his fund from his apartment in Queens and it happened as a result of necessity. He worked at this brokerage and <laughs> he thought it would be funny to hire when we talked about merit-based systems and opportunity and equality. And I'm going to tell you this fucking story. So he hired a stripper to come to the firm <laughs> for, for, for the boss and the boss did not find it amusing and fired him. And so, you know, he was this late 20, early 30 something kid from Queens trying to figure life out. And he said, you know what, I'll start, I'll start my own fund. And here we are, you know, many billions later. Right. So Yep. Fasc fascinating book. It's about, you know, a radical, a, a commitment to radical truth and transparency. And it also has some good, you know, obviously funny tidbits and stories and personal details. But if, uh, if you're on a plane trip or a rail ride or whatever the heck you do, go buy a book, read a little bit. It's good for your brain. It's, it's good stuff. Good stuff. I'll have to read it. I actually haven't read it. And I, I lied. I'm not done yet. I have to tell you that I'll be speaking at the, the Vancouver Research uh, Investment the Conference. The shameless plug. I I'm not going to let you do it, you. Nick. Fuck that. No. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Go ahead. I'm sorry. January 20th and 21st. Link below in Vancouver. If you're around, just come say hi. Fantastic. And in all jokes aside, can you give us the name of the conference again? Yeah, it's the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. It's one of the biggest in the sector uh, outside of PDAC and January 20th, 21st in at the Vancouver Convention Center. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, we talked 2018. We handed out some awards. We talked the Trumpster guy. Um, we talked whales, man. That was awesome. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and the founding fathers and, you know, how they were kind of dicks. Not all of them, but most of them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think I think that's it. Do you have anything else for this week, Nick? I know we got tons of stuff. We could keep going forever, but um, anything else that's important to you? Should we look ahead next mm -hmm. week? Just watch the gold price. Watch the crypto price. Things are happening. Uh, what happened to all the crypto gurus? Where are they at? I, I, I heard you shouting them out earlier on Twitter or saw you t shouting them out. What happened to all they're those only, guys? They're only gurus when Bitcoin is above 15,000. Ah, uh, man. Is that the way that works? Uh. Yep. <laughs> Tough. All right. Well, hopefully we see them again. That was interesting, right? That's exactly right. I think they'll be back. Good stuff. All right, everybody. Thanks for uh, hanging out with us next week. I think we'll definitely be looking forward to 2019. We'll talk gold. We'll talk cobalt. We'll talk what to expect, what we expect, and uh, companies we like, and, and, and what's out there that, that maybe you might be able to make a penny on. Does that sound good, Nick? Sounds good. Sounds fun. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Bizarro World, Episode 1.